morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am coming to you from my home on day 4,721 of quarantine. <clears throat> we are going to go over um, the next part of the five people you meet in heaven. We're going to go into the third person, and me and my Starbucks mug are just going to sit here and read to you. And we're going to go over a few things about Eddie and his family and what's going on. I miss you guys terribly. I am so looking forward to getting back to the classroom. But until then, I guess this is going to have to do. I hope these videos are helping you. And um, let's start going over stuff. So welcome to Remote Learning for April 27th to May 1st, Monday through Friday. This week we are going to review a little bit of uh, Eddie's sacrifice from last time and we're going to go into the third person. So let's take a look. The lesson from the second person who was the captain said that sacrifice is a part of life. Now, he says that sometimes when you sacrifice something, you really just pass it on to somebody else. Meaning that when you sacrifice some of your time to do something, you're really giving somebody else something that they need because you've used your time to do that. So you're passing your, your sacrifice on to somebody else. So if we look at the sacrifices Eddie's made so far, there's a huge one right in the beginning. He sacrificed his life attempting to save the little girl. So we can look at that sacrifice. We can also look at the fact that he did go off to war. He did go off and fight for his country and that's a sacrifice that he made. He left his family, he left Marguerite and he left his job not knowing what he was coming home to. So he did make a huge sacrifice by going off to war. He also sacrificed some of his health. He is not only ridden with mental health issues at this point from being captured by crazy one, crazy two, crazy three, and crazy four, but he's also angry because he's no longer the strong man that he was when he got there because the captain shot his leg. And essentially the captain made that sacrifice because he knew that he would heal from a leg wound. That if he went into a burning hut where there was nobody there, he probably would have died. But if he shot him in the leg, a leg would heal. Now, Eddie has been angry about this sacrifice for his entire life because he's not the strong man. He hated that his, his legs creaked and everything hurt and he came back a different man. He was angry about his sacrifice. Um, it's an important life lesson and granted, we would have had a whole discussion in the classroom, but since we're not there, it's an important life lesson to understand that sometimes we do things we don't wanna do. Sometimes we sacrifice time with our friends to pick up our little brother or sister from school. So we don't do things for ourselves after school because we're picking up our brothers or sisters. Sometimes we sacrifice our time to take care of um, a loved one. Sometimes we sacrifice money. We give money to people who need it. We pass it on to somebody else. It's an important life lesson that the world doesn't really revolve around us. We make sacrifices and we do things that benefit others, hopefully. I mean, that's the kind of world we wanna live in, the one where people actually do care about other people and they do wanna make sacrifices for others. Chart. That jade means money, growth, fertility, freshness, and healing, or envy, jealousy, and guilt. Purple means royalty, nobility, spirituality, luxury, ambition, or it could be mystery and moodiness. So these are the two colors that we're going to see, and we're going to get to this third part of heaven. The third person Eddie meets in heaven. A sudden wind lifted Eddie, and he spun like a pocket watch on the end of a chain. An explosion of smoke engulfed him, swallowing his body in a flume of colors. The sky seemed to pull in until he could feel it touching his skin like a gathered blanket. Then it shot away and exploded into jade. Stars appeared, millions of stars, like salt sprinkled across the greenish firmament. Eddie blinked. He was in the mountains now, but the most remarkable mountains, a range that went on forever, with snow-capped peaks, jagged rocks, and sheer purple slopes. In a flat between two crests was a large black lake. A moon reflected brightly in its water. Down the ridge, Eddie noticed a flickering of colored light that changed rhythmically every few seconds. He stepped in that direction and realized he was ankle deep in snow. He lifted his foot and shook it hard and the flakes fell loose, glistening with golden sheen. When he touched them, they were neither cold nor wet. Where am I now, Eddie thought. Once again, he took stock of his body, pressing on his shoulders, his chest and his stomach. His arm muscles remained tight, but his midsection was looser, flabbier. 
He hesitated, then squeezed his left knee. It throbbed in pain, and Eddie winced. He had hoped upon leaving the captain that he, that the wound would disappear, and instead it was seemed he was becoming the man he'd been on Earth, scars and fat and all. Why would heaven make you relive your own decay? He followed the flickering lights down the narrow ridge. This landscape, stark and silent, was breathtaking, more like how he'd imagined heaven. He wondered for a moment if the, he had somehow finished, if the captain had been wrong, if there were no more people to meet. He came through the snow around a rock ledge to a large clearing from which the lights originated. He blinked again, this time in disbelief. There in the snowy field, sitting by itself, was a boxcar-shaped building with a stainless steel exterior and a red barrel roof. A sign above it blinked the word, eat. A diner. Eddie had spent many hours in places like this. They all looked the same. High-backed booths, shiny countertops, a row of small paned windows across the front, which from the outside made customers appear like riders in a railroad car. He, Eddie could make out figures through those windows now, people talking and gesturing. He walked up the snowy steps to the double pane door and he peered inside. An elderly couple was sitting to his right eating pie. They took no notice of him. Other customers sat in swivel chairs at the marble counter or inside booths with their coats on hooks. They appeared to be from the different decades. Eddie saw a woman with a 1930s high collar dress and a long haired man, young man with a 1960s peace sign tattooed on his arm. Many of the patrons appeared to have been wounded. A black man in a work shirt was missing an arm. A teenage girl had a deep gash across her face and none of them looked over when Eddie rapped on the window. He saw cooks wearing white paper hats and plates of steaming food on the counter awaiting serving, food in the most succulent colors, deep red sauces, yellow buttercreams, his eyes moved along to the last booth in the right-hand corner. He froze. What he saw, he could not have seen. No, he heard himself whisper. He turned back from the door and he drew deep breaths. His heart pounded. He spun around and looked again, then banged wildly on the window panes. No, Eddie yelled. No, no. He banged until he was sure the glass would break. No. He kept yelling till the word he wanted, a word he hadn't spoken in decades, finally formed in his throat. He screamed that word then. He screamed it so loudly that his head throbbed, but the figure inside the booth remained hunched over, oblivious, one hand resting on the table, the other holding a cigar, never looking up, no matter how many times that he howled it over and over again. Dad! 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 <clears throat> when we look at the relationships... Now, sorry, hold on. We're going to look at the relationships. Now, the relationship that's really important here is to really look at the, at the Eddie's relationship with his father. Now, when I ask you about his relationship with his father, a lot of you are saying it's a bad one. And you know I can't stand that. But a lot of us are saying that a father doesn't care about him. But that doesn't describe the relationship. When you're describing a relationship between two people, you can say that it's strained, it's difficult, they don't get along very well. You have to describe how they interact. A relationship is how they interact. So it's a very strained relationship, which means that it's stressful, it's not easy, it's anxious, it's like anxiety, it's that pit in your stomach, and his mother, however, is the one who doles out the love in the family, but his father doles out the punishments and the discipline. And generally in this time period and a lot of time periods, mom gives the love, dad gives the discipline. It may not be that way today, but a lot of old school families do deal that way. Like, wait till your father gets home. Um, so we're going to look at pages 102 to 103, and we're going to look at the line that illustrates the relationship is strained. So he's at this point for this birthday, he's in the VA hospital, which is in the Veterans Affairs, which means that he has just um, been shot and he's brought back to the States and he's in the hospital for his leg. So let's take a look. Today is Eddie's birthday. In the dim and sterile hallway of the VA hospital, Eddie's mother opens the white bakery box and rearranges the candles on the cake, making them even. 12 on one side, 12 on the other. The rest of them, Eddie's father, Joe, Marguerite, Mickey Shea, stand around her watching. Does anyone have a match? She whispered. They pat their pa pockets and Mickey fishes a pack from his jacket, dropping two loose cigarettes on the floor. Eddie's mother lights the candle and uh, candles, an elevator pings down the hall, a gurney emerges. All right, then let's go, she says. The small flames wiggle as they move together. The group enters Eddie's room singing softly, happy birthday to you. Happy 
happy birthday to this soldier in the next bed wakes up yelling, what the hell? He realizes where he is and drops back down embarrassed. The song, once interrupted, seems too heavy to lift again. And only Eddie's mother's voice, shaking in its solitude, is able to continue. Happy birthday, dear Eddie. Then quickly, happy birthday to you. Eddie props himself against the pillow. His burns are bandaged. His leg is in a long cast. There's a pair of crutches by the bed. He looks at these faces and he is consumed by a desire to run away. Joe clears his throat. Well, hey, you look pretty good, he says. And the others quickly agree. Good. Yes, very good. Your mom got a cake, Marguerite whispers. Eddie's mother steps forward as if it's her turn and she presents the cardboard box. Eddie mumbles, thanks, Ma. She looks around. Now, where should we put this? Mickey grabs a chair. Joe clears a small tabletop. Marguerite moves Eddie's crutches. And only his father does not shuffle for the sake of shuffling. He stands against the back wall, a jacket over his arm, staring at Eddie's leg, encased in plaster from thigh to ankle. Eddie catches his eye. His father looks down and runs his hand over the windowsill. Eddie tightens every muscle in his body and attempts by sheer will to force the tears back into their ducts. Now I'm gonna go on to what's um, called an extended metaphor. If you remember, we had a, a discussion about metaphors and similes when we were going over speak. When we talk about a metaphor, a metaphor is essentially just a comparison of two things without using like or as. This room looks like a jungle. This, um, if you see the top right hand corner, it says, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, Elvis Presley's song. That's a metaphor, just comparing two things without using like or as. When we talk about an extended metaphor, it's a comparison of two things at length through the use of a long passage or an entire poem. So if you've ever read, Oh Captain, My Captain, that's an extended metaphor. <clears throat> and it goes over um, historical events. Album is going to introduce an extended metaphor on pages 104 to 110. And let me explain what that means. What that means is he is going to explain Eddie's childhood as a pristine glass. Now, pristine means perfect, gorgeous, no flaws. And he's going to describe Eddie's childhood, which is an inanimate object, as a pristine glass. He states on 104, which I'm going to read to you, all parents damage their children. It cannot be helped. Youth, like pristine glass, absorbs the prints of its handlers. Some parents smudge. Others crack. A few shatter childhoods completely into jagged little pieces beyond repair. So while we read, I want you to kind of take a note of three citations that explain the three damages Eddie's father did to his childhood glass. Now again, in class, we would have done this together. We would have stopped. So here I'm going to do a lot of the explaining. So we're going to look at how each level of damage would affect Ch Eddie's childhood. So the first um, damage is neglect, which is the fingerprints. Now, neglect is obviously very terrible for a child to feel neglected by their parents, but it's a fingerprint. It's not as damaging as the other things that Eddie's father will do. So let's take a look. All parents damage their children. It cannot be helped. Youth, like pristine glass, absorbs the prints of its handlers. Some parents smudge, Others crack and few shatter childhoods completely into jagged little pieces beyond repair. The damage done by Eddie's father was at the beginning the damage of neglect. As an infant, Eddie was rarely held by the man. And as a child, he was mostly grabbed by the arm, less with love than with annoyance. Eddie's mother handed out the tenderness. His father was there for the discipline. On Saturdays, Eddie's father took him to the pier and Eddie would leave the apartment with visions of carousels and globs of cotton candy. But after an hour or so, his father would find a familiar face and say, watch a kid for me, will you? Until his father returned, usually late in the afternoon, often drunk, Eddie stayed in the custody of an acrobat or an animal trainer. Still, for countless hours of his boardwalk youth, Eddie waited for his father's attention, sitting on railings or squatting in his short pants atop tool chests in the repair shop. And often he'd say, I can help, I can help. But the only job entrusted him was crawling beneath the Ferris wheel, in the morning before the park opened to collect coins that had fallen from customers' pockets the night before. At least four evenings a week, his father played cards. The table had money, bottles, cigarettes, and rules. Eddie's rule was simple, do not disturb. Once he tried to stand next to his father and look at his cards, but the old man put down his cigar and erupted like thunder, smacking Eddie's face with the back of his hand. Stop breathing on me, he said. 
Eddie burst into tears and his mother pulled him to her waist, glaring at her husband. Eddie never got that close again. Other nights when the cards went bad and the bottles had been emptied and his mother was already asleep, his father brought his thunder into Eddie and Joe's bedroom. He raked through the meager toys, hurling them against the wall, and then he made his sons lie face down on the mattress while he pulled off his belt and lashed their rear ends, screaming that they were wasting his money on junk. Eddie used to pray for his mother to wake up, but even the times she did, his father warned her to stay out of it. Seeing her in the hallway clutching her robe as helpless as he was, as, <clears throat> as he was, made it all even worse. The hands on Eddie's child to glass were hard and calloused and red with anger. And he went through his younger years whacked, lashed, and beaten. And this was the second damage done, the one after neglect. The damage of violence. It got so that Eddie could tell that by the thump of the footsteps coming down the hall, how hard he was going to get it. Through it all, despite it all, Eddie privately adored his old man. Because sons will adore their fathers even through the worst behavior. It's how they learn devotion. Before he can devote himself to God or a woman, a boy will devote himself to his father. Even foolishly, even beyond explanation. And on occasion, as if to feed the weakest embers of a fire, Eddie's father let a wrinkle of pride crack through the veneer of his disinterest. At the baseball field by the 14th Avenue schoolyard, his father stood behind the fence watching Eddie play. If Eddie smacked the ball into the outfield, his father nodded. And when he did, Eddie leapt around the bases. Other times when Eddie came home from an alley fight, his father would notice his scraped knuckles or split lip. He would ask, what happened to the other guy? And Eddie would say he got him good. And this too met with his father's approval. When Eddie attacked the kids who were bothering his brother, the hoodlums, his mother called them, Joe was ashamed and hid in his room. But Eddie's father said, never mind them, you're the strong one. Be your brother's keeper. Don't let nobody touch him. When Eddie started junior high, he mimicked his father's summer schedule, rising before the sun, working at the park until the nightfall. At first, he ran the simpler rides, maneuvering the brake leather levers, bringing the train cars to a gentle stop. In later years, he worked in the repair shop. Eddie's father would test him with the maintenance problems. He'd hand him with broken steering wheel and say, fix it. He'd point out a tangled chain and say, fix it. He'd carry over a rusty fender and some sandpaper and say, fix it. And every time upon completion of the task, Eddie would walk the item back to his father and say, it's fixed. At night, they would gather at the dinner table, his mother plump and sweating, cooking by the stove, his brother Joe talking away, his hair and skin smelling from seawater. Joe had become a good swimmer, and his, that's, his summer was at work was at the Ruby Pier pool. Joe talked about all the people he saw there, their swimsuits, their money. Eddie's father wasn't impressed. Once Eddie overheard him talking to his mother about Joe. That one, he said, ain't tough enough for anything but water. Still, Eddie envied the way his brother looked in the evening, so tanned and clean. Eddie's fingernail, like his father, was stained with grease, and at the dinner table, Eddie would flick them with his thumbnail, trying to get the dirt out. He caught his father watching him once and the old man grinned. Shows you did a hard day's work, he said. And he held up his own dirty fingernails before wrapping them around a glass of beer. By this point, already a strapping teenager, Eddie only nodded back. Unbeknownst to him, he had begun the ritual of semaphore with his father, forsaking words or physical affection. It was all to be done internally. You were just supposed to know, that's all. Denial of affection, the damage done. And then one night, the speaking stopped altogether. This was after the war when Eddie had been released from the hospital and the cast had been removed from his leg, and he had moved back into the family apartment on Beechwood Avenue. His father had been drinking at the nearby pub, and he came home late to find Eddie asleep on the couch. The darkness of combat had left Eddie changed. He stayed indoors. He rarely spoke, even to Marguerite. He spent hours staring out the kitchen window, watching the carousel ride, rubbing his bad knee. His mother whispered that he just needed time, but his father grew more agitated each day. He didn't understand depression. To him, it was a weakness. Get up, he yelled now, his words slurring, and get a job. Eddie stirred and his father yelled again, get up and get a job. The old man was wobbling, but he came toward Eddie and pushed him. Get up and get a job. Get up and get a job. Get up and get a job. Eddie rose to his elbows. Get up and get a job. Get up and enough. Eddie yelled, surging to his feet, ignoring the burst of pain in his knee. He glared at his father, his face just inches away. He could smell the bad breath of alcohol and cigarettes. The old man glanced at Eddie's leg, his voice lowered to a growl. See? You ain't so hurt. He reeled back to throw a punch, but Eddie moved on instinct and grabbed his father's arm mid-swing. 
The old man's eyes widened. This was the first time that he had ever defended himself. The first time he'd ever done anything besides receive a beating as if he deserved it. His father looked at his own clenched fist short of its mark and his nostrils flared and his teeth gritted and he staggered backwards and yanked his arm free. He stared at Eddie with the eyes of a man watching a train pull away. He never spoke to his son again. This was the final handprint on Eddie's glass. Silence. It haunted their remaining years. His father was silent when Eddie moved into his own apartment, silent when Eddie took a cab driving job, silent at Eddie's wedding, silent when Eddie came to visit his mother. She begged and wept and beseeched her husband to change his mind and let it go, but Eddie's father would only say to her through a clenched jaw what he said to others who made the same request. That boy raised a hand to me. And that was the end of the conversation. All parents damaged their children. This was their life together. Neglect, violence, silence. And now, someplace beyond death, Eddie slumped against a stainless steel wall and dropped into a snowbank, stung again by the denial of a man whose love, almost inexplicably, he still coveted. A man ignoring him, even in heaven. His father, the damage done. The example of the damages. Fingerprints. Cracks. Shattering. If we look on page 104, we know that neglect is the childhood fingerprint. Is neglect something that can be washed away? Kind of, because a parent can simply be there for their child. They'll never forget that they neglected them and they'll never forget how they felt. Like that, we know that the fingerprint is on the glass, but we can wash it away simply by doing certain things. When you talk about a cracked glass, a cracked glass cannot be fixed. This is something that goes straight into the garbage. At this point, we no longer want to use this glass. It will cut us, it will hurt us. So we don't use the cracked, cracked glass. The cracked glass is the violence. Violence is something we can live without. Eddie's father beating him on page 105 and 106. This is the, the oops, this is like freaking out a little. This is the damage of violence. It's the cracked glass. The last thing is the shattering. Once a glass is shattered, it is obviously the most painful thing because not only are the big shards on the floor and they're everywhere, but there's those tiny little shards that you walk around barefoot one day and oh crap, I stepped on it, I cut my foot. It's something that comes back to haunt you forever. No matter how well you vacuum, there's always a tiny piece of glass to find your barefoot seven months later, eight months later. So the shattering is the denial of affection on page 108. So this relationship through with his father, it's not that it's bad and he doesn't like him and he doesn't love him. It's that he was denied affection. It was violent and he was neglected. So it's a terrible strained relationship because Eddie can't he can't forgive his father for hurting him in these ways. We can forgive a little bit of neglect, a little bit. We cannot forgive a whole ton of it. And we can kind of get over a little bit of violence. We'll never forget it. But denial of affection from a parent, forget it. Let's move on to more reading. Don't be angry, a woman's voice said. He can't hear you. Eddie jerked his head up. An old woman stood before him in the snow. Her face was gaunt with sagging cheeks, rose-colored lipstick, and tightly pulled back white hair, thin enough in parts to reveal the pink scalp beneath it. She wore wire-rimmed spe spectacles over her narrow blue eyes. Eddie could not recall her. Her clothes were before his time, a dress made of silk and chiffon with a bib-like bodice stitched with white beads and topped with a velvet white bow just below her neck. Her skirt had a rhinestone buckle and there were snaps and hooks up the side. She stood with elegant posture, holding her parasol with both hands, and Eddie guessed she'd been rich. Not always rich, she said, grinning as if she had heard him. I was raised much like you were, in the back end of the city, forced to leave school when I was 14. I was a working girl, so were my sisters. We gave every nickel back to the family. Eddie interrupted. He didn't want another story. Why can't my father hear me? He demanded. She smiled. Because his spirit safe and sound, is part of my eternity. But he's not really here. You are. Why does my father have to be safe for you? She paused. Come. Suddenly, they were at the bottom of the mountain. The light from the diner was now just a speck like a star that had fallen into a crevice. Beautiful, isn't it? The old woman said. 
Eddie followed her eyes. There was something about her as if he'd seen her in a photograph or some her photograph somewhere. Are you my third person? I am at that, she said. Eddie rubbed his head. Who was this woman? At least with the blue man, at least with the captain, he had some recollection of their place in his life. Why a stranger? Why now? Eddie had once hoped death would mean a reunion with those who went before him. He had attended so many funerals, polishing his black dress shoes, finding a hat standing in the cemetery with the same despairing question, why are they gone and I'm still here? His mother, his brother, his aunts and uncles, his buddy Noel, Marguerite. One day the priest would say, we will all be together in the kingdom of heaven. Where were they then, if this was heaven? Eddie studied the strange old woman, older woman. He felt more alone than ever. Can I see earth, he whispered. She shook her head no. Can I talk to God? You can always do that. He hesitated before asking the next question. Can I go back? She squinted. Back? Yeah, back, Eddie said. To my life, to that last day. Is there something I can do? Can I promise to be good? Can I promise to go to church all the time? Something? Why? She seemed amused. Why? Eddie repeated. He swiped at the snow that had no cold with a bare hand that felt no moisture. Why? Because this place don't make no sense to me. Because I don't feel like no angel, if that's what I'm supposed to feel like. Because I don't feel like I got it all figured out. I can't even remember my own death. I can't remember the accident. All I remember are these two little hands, this little girl I was trying to save. See? I was pulling her out of the way, and I must have grabbed her hands, and that's when I... He shrugged. Died? The old woman had said, smiling. Passed away. Moved on? Met your maker. Died, he said, exhaling. And that's all I remember. Then you, the others, all this, ain't you supposed to have peace when you die? You have peace, the old woman said, when you make it with yourself. Nah, Eddie said, shaking his head. Nah, you don't. He thought about telling her the agitation he felt every day since the war, the bad dreams, the inability to get excited about much of anything, the times he went to the docks alone and watched the fish pulled in by the wide rope nets, embarrassed because he saw himself in those helpless flopping creatures, snared and beyond escape. He didn't tell her that. Instead, he said, no offense, lady, but I don't even know you. But I know you, she said. Eddie sighed. Oh, yeah, how's that? Well, she said, if you have a moment. And she sat down then. Although there was nothing to sit on, she simply rested on the air and crossed her legs, ladylike, keeping her spine straight. The long skirt folded neatly around her, a breeze blew and Eddie caught the faint scent of perfume. As I mentioned, I was once a working girl. My job was serving, place in a, serving food in a place called the Seahorse Grill. It was near the ocean where you grew up. Perhaps you remember it? She nodded toward the diner and it all came back to Eddie. Of course, that place. He used to eat breakfast there. A greasy spoon, they called it. They torn it down years ago. You, Eddie said almost laughing, you were a waitress at the Seahorse. Indeed, she said proudly. I served dock, walker, dock workers their coffee and longshoremen their crab cakes and bacon. I was an attractive girl in those years, I might add. I turned away many a proposal. My sisters would scold me. Who are you to be so choosy, they would say. Find a man before it's too late. And then one morning, the finest looking gentleman I had ever seen walked through the door. He wore a chalk striped suit and a derby hat. His dark hair was neatly cut and his mustache covered a constant smile. He nodded when I served him and I tried not to stare. But when he spoke with his colleague, I could hear his heavy, confident laughter. Twice, I caught him looking in my direction. When he paid his bill, he said his name was Emil and he asked if I, he might call on me. And I knew right then my sisters would no longer have to hound me for a decision. Our courtship was exhilarating for Emil was a man of means. He took me places I had never been, bought me clothes I had never imagined, Paid for meals I had never experienced in my poor sheltered life. Emil had earned his wealth quickly from investments in lumber and steel. He was a splendor, a risk taker. He went over the boards when he got an idea, and I suppose that's why he was drawn to a poor girl like me. He abhorred those who were born into wealth and rather enjoyed doing things the sophisticated people would never do. One of those things was visiting seaside resorts. He loved the attractions, the salty food, the gypsies, and the fortune tellers, and the weight guessers, and the diving girls. And we both loved the sea. One day, as we sat in the sand, the tide rolling gently to our feet, he asked for my hand in marriage. I was overjoyed. I told him yes, and we heard the sounds of children playing in the ocean. 
Emil went over the boards again and swore that soon he would build a resort park just for me to capture the happiness of this moment to stay eternally young. The old woman smiled. Emil kept his promise. A few years later, he made a deal with the railroad company, which was looking for a way to increase riders on the weekend. That's how most amusement parks were built, you know. Eddie nodded. He did know. Most people didn't. They thought amusement parks were constructed by elves built with candy canes. In fact, they were simply business opportunities for railroad companies who erected them at final stops of routes so commuters would have a reason to ride on the weekends. You know where I work, Eddie used to say? The end of the line. That's where I work. Emil, the old woman continued, built the most wonderful place, a massive pier using timber and steel he already owned. Then came the magical attractions, races and rides and boat trips and tiny railways. There was a carousel imported from France and a Ferris wheel from one of the internal exhibitions in Germany. There were towers and spires and thousands of incandescent lights, so bright that at night you could see the park from the ship's deck on the ocean. Emil hired hundreds of workers, municipal workers and carnival workers and foreign workers. He brought in animals and acrobats and clowns. The entrance was the last thing finished and it was truly grand. Everyone said so. When it was complete, he took me there with a cloth blindfold over my eyes. When he removed the blindfold, I saw it. The old woman took a step back from Eddie. She looked at him curiously as if she were disappointed. The entrance, she said. Don't you remember? Didn't you ever wonder about the name where you worked, where your father worked? She touched her chest softly with her white gloved fingers, and then she dipped as if formally introducing herself. I, she said, am Ruby. Today's Eddie's birthday. He's 33. He wakes with a jolt, gasping for breath. His thick black hair is matted with sweat. He blinks hard against the darkness, trying desperately to focus on his arm, his knuckles, anything to know that he's here. In the apartment over the bakery and not back in the war, in the village in the fire. That dream, whatever stop? It's just before 4 a.m., no point in going back to sleep. He waits until his breathing subsides and then slowly rolls off the bed, trying not to wake his wife. He puts his right leg down first, out of habit, avoiding the inevitable stiffness of his left. Eddie begins every morning the same way, one step, one hobble. In the bathroom, he checks his bloodshot eyes and splashes water on his face. It's always the same dream. Eddie wandering through the flames in the Philippines on his last night of the war. The village huts are engulfed in fire and there's a constant high-pitched squealing noise. Something invisible hits Eddie's legs and he squats at it but misses. Swats at it and misses, but then swats again and misses again. The flames grow more intense, roaring like an engine, and then Smitty appears, yelling for Eddie, come on, come on. Eddie tries to speak, but when he opens his mouth, the high-pitched squeal emerges from his throat and then something grabs his legs, pulling him under the muddy earth. And then he wakes up, sweating, panting, always the same. The worst part is not the sleeplessness. The worst part is the general darkness the dream leaves over him, a gray film that clouds the day. Even in his happy moments, he feel encased like holes jabbed in the hard sheet of ice. He dresses quietly, goes down the stairs. The taxi is parked by the corner, its usual spot, and Eddie wipes the moisture from his windshield. He never speaks about the darkness to Marguerite. She strokes his hair and says, what's wrong? And he says, nothing, I'm just beat, and leaves it at that. How can he explain such sadness when she's supposed to make him happy? The truth is he cannot explain it himself. All he knows is that something stepped in front of him, blocking his way, until in time he gave up on things. He gave up on studying engineering, and he gave up on the idea of traveling. He sat down in his life, and there he remained. This night, when Eddie returns from work, he parks the taxi by the corner. He comes slowly up the stairs, from his apartment, he hears a familiar song. <clears throat> Excuse me. You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. <clears throat> I didn't want to do it. He opens the door to see a cake on the table and a small white bag tied with a ribbon. Honey, Marguerite yells in the bedroom. Is that you? He lifts the white bag. Taffy from the pier. Happy birthday to you. Marguerite emerges singing in her soft, sweet voice. She looks beautiful wearing the print dress Eddie likes, her hair and lips done up. Eddie feels the need to inhale as if undeserving of such a moment. He fights the darkness within him. Leave me alone, he tells it. Let me feel this way. I should feel it. Marguerite finishes the song and kisses him on the lips. Want to fight me for the taffy, she whispers. He moves to kiss her again and someone raps at the door. Eddie, are you in there? Eddie! Mr. Nathanson, the baker, lives in the ground level apartment behind the store. He has a telephone. When Eddie opens the door, he's standing in the doorway wearing a bathrobe. He looks concerned. Eddie, he says, come down. There's a phone call. I think something happened to your father. <clears throat> I am Ruby. It suddenly made sense to Eddie why the woman looked familiar. 
He had seen her photograph somewhere in the back of the repair shop among old manuals and paperwork from the park's initial ownership. The old entrance, Eddie said. She nodded in satisfaction. The original Ruby Pier entrance had been something of a landmark, a giant arching structure based on a historic French temple and fluted columns with a cove dome at the top. Just beneath that dome, which under all patrons would pass, was the painted face of a beautiful woman. This woman, Ruby. But that thing was destroyed a long time ago, Eddie said. There was a big, he paused, fire. The old woman said, yes, a very big fire. She dropped her chin and her eyes looked down through her spectacles as if she were reading from her lap. It was Independence Day, the 4th of July, a holiday. Emil loved holidays. Good for business, he'd say. If Independence Day went well, the entire summer might go well. So Emil arranged for fireworks. He brought in a marching band. He even hired extra workers, rustabouts, mostly just for that weekend. But something happened the night before the celebration. It was hot even after the sun went down, and a few of the rustabouts chose to sleep outside behind the work sheds. They lit a fire in a metal barrel to roast their food. As the night went on, there was drinking and carousing. The workers got a hold of some of the smaller fireworks and they set them off. The wind blew, the sparks flew. Everything in those days was made of lath and tar. She shook her head. The rest happened quickly. The fire spread to the midway in the food stalls and onto the animal cages. The rustabouts ran off and by the time someone came to our home to wake us, Ruby Pier was in flames. From our window, we saw the horrible ant orange blaze. We heard the horses hooves and the steamer engines of the fire companies and people were in the street. I begged Emil not to go, but that was fruitless. Of course he would go. He would go to the raging fire and he would try to salvage his years of work and he would lose himself in anger and fear when the entrance caught fire. The entrance with my name and my picture. He lost all sense of where he was too. He was trying to throw buckets of water when a column collapsed upon him. She put her fingers together and raised them to her lips. In the course of one night, our lives were changed forever. Risk taker that he was, Emil had acquired only minimal insurance on the pier. He lost his fortune. His splendid gift to me was gone. In desperation, he sold the char grounds to a businessman from Pennsylvania for far less than what it was worth. That businessman kept the name Ruby Pier, and in time, he reopened the park, but it wasn't ours anymore. Emil's spirit was as broken as his body, and it took three years before he could walk on his own. We moved away to a place outside the city, a small flat where our lives were spent modestly, me tending to my wounded husband and silently nurturing a single wish. She stopped. What wish, Eddie said, that he had never built that place. The old woman sat in silence and Eddie studied the vast jade sky. He thought about how many times he wished the same thing, that whoever had built Ruby Pure did something else with his money. Sorry about your husband, Eddie said, mostly because he didn't know what else to say. The old woman smiled. Thank you, dear, but we lived many years beyond those flames. We raised three children. Emil was sickly in and out of the hospital, and he left me a widow in my 50s. You see these face, these wrinkles? She turned her cheeks upwards. I earned every one of them. Eddie frowned. I, I don't understand. Did we ever meet? Did you ever come to the pier? No, she said. I never wanted to see the pier again. My children went there and their children and theirs, but not me. My idea of heaven was far away from, far from the ocean as possible. Back in that busy diner when my days were simple, when Emil was courting me. Eddie rubbed his temples. When he breathed, mist emerged. So why am I here, he said. I mean, your story, the fire, it all happened before I was born. Well, things that happen before you're born still affect you, she said. And people who come before your time affect you as well. We move through places every day that would never have been if not for those who came before us. Our workplaces where we spend so much time, we often think they began with our arrival, but that's not true. She tapped her fingerprints together, fingertips together. If not for Emil, I would have no husband. If not for our marriage, there would be no peer. If there had been no peer, you would not have ended up working there. Eddie scratched his head. So you're here to tell me about work. No, dear, Ruby answered, her voice softening. I'm here to tell you why your father died. The phone call was from Eddie's mother. His father had collapsed that afternoon on the east end of the boardwalk near the junior rocket ride. He had a raging fever. Eddie, I'm afraid, his mother said, her voice shaking. She told him of a night earlier in the week when his father had come home at dawn, soaking wet. His clothes were full of sand. He was missing a shoe. She said he smelled like the ocean. Eddie bet he smelled like liquor, too. He was coughing, his mother explained, and it just got worse. We should have called the doctor right away, she drifted in her words. He'd gone to work that day, she said, sick as he was, with his tool belt and his ball-peen hammer, same as always, but that night he refused to eat. And in bed, he hacked and wheezed and sweated through his undershirt. And the next day was worse. And now this afternoon, 
He had collapsed. The doctor said it's pneumonia. Oh, I should have done something. I should have done something. What were you supposed to do, Eddie asked. He was mad that she took this on herself. It was his father's drunken fault. Through the phone, he heard her crying. Eddie's father used to say he'd spent so many years by the ocean that he breathed seawater. Now away from that ocean in the confines of a hospital bed, his body began to wither like a beached fish. Complications developed, congestion built in his chest, and his condition went from fair to stable and from stable to serious. Friends went from saying he'll be home in a day to he'll be home in a week. In his father's absence, Eddie helped out at the pier, working evenings after his taxi job, greasing the tracks, checking the brake pads, testing the levers, and even repairing broken ride parts in the shop. What he was really doing was protecting his father's job. The owners acknowledged his efforts and then paid him half of what his father earned. He gave the money to his mother, who went to the hospital every day and slept there most nights. Eddie and Marguerite cleaned her apartment and shopped for her food. When Eddie was a teenager, if he ever complained or seemed bored with the pier, his father would snap, What, this ain't good enough for you? And later, when he suggested Eddie take a job after, there after high school, Eddie almost laughed, and his father said, What, this ain't good enough for you? And before Eddie went to war, when he talked of marrying Marguerite and becoming an engineer, his father said, What, this ain't good enough for you? And now, despite that all, here he was at the pier doing his father's labor. Finally, one night at his mother's urging, Eddie visited the hospital. He entered the room slowly. His father, who for years had refused to speak to Eddie, now lacked the strength to even try. He watched his son with heavy-lidded eyes, and Eddie, after struggling to find one sentence to say, did the only thing he could think of to do. He held up his hands and showed his father his grease-stained fingertips. Don't sweat it, kid, the other maintenance workers told him. Your old man will pull through. He's the toughest son of a gun we've ever seen. Parents rarely let go of their children, so children let go of them. They move on. They move away. The moments that used to define them, a mother's approval, a father's nod, are covered by moments in their own accomplishments. It's not until much later, as the skin sags and the heart weakens, that children understand their stories of their mothers and fathers, stones upon stones beneath the waters of their lives. When the news came that his father had died, slipped away, as the nurse had told him, as if he'd gone out for milk, Eddie felt the emptiest kind of anger, the kind that circles in its cage. Like most working man's sons, Eddie had envisioned for his father a heroic death to counter the commonness of his life. There was nothing heroic about a drunken stupor by the beach. The next day, he went to his parents' apartment, entered their bedroom, and opened all the drawers as if he might find a piece of his father inside. He rifled through coins, a tie pin, a small bottle of apple brandy, rubber bands, electric bills, pens, a cigarette lighter with a mermaid on the side. Finally, he found a deck of playing cards, and he put it in his pocket. The funeral was small and brief, and the weeks that followed, Eddie's mother lived in a daze. She spoke to her husband as if he were still there. She yelled at him to turn down the radio. She cooked enough food for two. She fluffed pillows on both sides of the bed, even though one side had been slept in. One night, Eddie saw her stacking dishes on the countertop. Let me help you, he said. No, no, his mother answered. Your father will put them away. Eddie put his hand on her shoulder. Ma, he said softly, Dad's gone. Gone where? The next day, Eddie went to the dispatcher and told him he was quitting. Two weeks later, he and Marguerite moved back into the building where Eddie had grown up, Beechwood Avenue, apartment 6B, where the hallways were narrow and the kitchen window viewed the carousel where Eddie had accepted a job that would let him keep an eye on his mother, a position he had been groomed for summer after summer, a maintenance man at Ruby Pier. Eddie never said this, not to his wife, not to his mother, not to anyone but he cursed his father for dying and for trapping him in the very life he'd been trying to escape. A life that, as he heard the old man laughing from the grave, apparently now was good enough for him. So going through the pages, um, I'd, I'd like you to define semaphore as it is used in the quote on page 108. I will upload a picture of page 108 so you can see it. Copy the quote, define the word, and explain what the quote means now that you know the definition. Question number two, explain Eddie's father's reason for never speaking to him again. Now let's remember all this damage and Eddie's father is the one who decides to never speak to Eddie again. Let's look back at page 113 and use race to explain how Eddie felt about the life he led. Restate, answer, cite evidence, and explain. Number four is a simple one, but it's kind of something I think you should know. Explain why amusement parks were originally built. Number five, we're going to use race again to explain how Ruby Pier burned down. 
Number six, how does Eddie's mother react to her husband's death? And we're gonna use some details to report, to support that answer. And the last thing is, why does Eddie blame his father for his life at the pier? Why is that his father's fault? Eddie made his own life choices. Why dad's fault? So explain. I hope you enjoyed this episode of me and my Starbucks mug and the third person so far. We'll be going over the third lesson next week. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please reach out to your friends and make sure that they're checking in because friends don't let friends fail, right? Am I right? Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you, know, you can reach out to me on any platform, email teams, Edmodo, and um, I will get back to you. I'm probably not answering you at 10 o'clock at night. I'm probably not answering you at two o'clock in the morning, but I will get back to you at a reasonable hour. Um, we're all in this together. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Stay inside. If you go somewhere, put on a face mask. Um, just stay safe. I hope everybody in your family is healthy. And again, if you need anything, just let me know. All right.